Good morning, everyone. I am Thad Swazinski, and I am a program facilitator working with the Regina District Industry Education Council and Good Spirit School Division. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Mullaney, who is the Director of Business Development at Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association. He leads a team of economic development professionals with the mandate to attract large-scale industrial investments to Alberta's industrial heartland. Just a reminder before we begin, this session is being recorded and will be appearing on the RDIEC YouTube channel for you or others to view in, this, in the future. We'd also like to request that any students who watch this session go to our website at www.rdiec.ca and complete the student survey that can be found near the top of the website's homepage. Completion of this survey gets your name in a monthly draw for a $50 gift card. Again, the website is www.rdiec.ca. Uh, once again, Chris, thanks for doing this uh, today. Welcome, and I'll turn it over to you now. All right, thank you for having me, and good morning, everybody. So I am Chris Blaney. I'm the Director of BD for Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association. For just a little bit of context, I work for an economic development agency. So it's investment attraction, economic development, whatever you want to call it. But our association has the core mandate to attract heavy industrial investments into the region known as Alberta's Industrial Heartland. So for some context, that would be an industrial area that's northeast of Edmonton, right adjacent to the city of Fort Saskatchewan. So it's it's land that's been designated as heavy industrials develop for designated for heavy industrial development by the five municipalities that make up our association. So what we do as an association, we've got kind of three major functions. We've got business development, which is the team I lead. We've got government relations, which does lobbying at the provincial and federal level and communications and community relations, which more focuses on keeping the communities involved in what's going on within the region and making sure they're up to date with all the projects that are taking place within the area. On the business development side, which is the team I lead, we are focused on working with companies to develop assets within our region. And when I talk about assets, it's large scale, multi-million, multi-billion dollar projects. It could be refineries, petrochemicals, fertilizers, anything that really is large capital and takes a long time to develop. The reason we go after these types of projects and why our municipalities fund us to do so is because it brings jobs, taxation, economic growth to the communities. There's a lot of agencies kind of similar in the economic development space at the municipal level, at the provincial level, at the federal level. We're a little bit different in the sense that our scope is very narrow. We focus strictly on heavy industrial and it's really constrained to a small area. So groups similar to us exist around the world as well, representing chemical clusters, heavy industrial clusters in Saudi Arabia, the U.S. Gulf Coast, kind of all over the world. That's who we see as our competitors when we're, we're going out in the world, talking to investors and trying to convince them to build stuff within our region. So within my role itself, I lead a team of about you know, it's three individuals, kind of mixed team, mostly economists and engineers. And it's really fo focused around going out to the world, finding out what's the economic opportunity for these companies, going to present to those companies and trying to convince them to start evaluating projects within our area. If they start evaluating projects within our area, then you become almost an extension of their project development team and kind of walk them through the entire process of building a project in Alberta. And this could look like a variety of different things. It's connecting the company with government. It's finding them JV partners. It's walking through how their utilities will work, how they're going to buy their feedstocks. Um, it really depends company to company. But because we are focused on primarily international investors, we go out into the world quite a bit, um, develop marketing strategies for how we're going to engage with certain types of clients and then actively pursue them. And this is all long-term relationship building for the most part. To build these types of projects, because they are usually multi-billion dollar assets, it takes anywhere from project con conception to implementation almost a decade sometimes, but typically four or five years, just even on the build side alone. So this is long-term. It's not very salesy. You're not trying to get any quick wins. It's really figuring out the economic opportunity, presenting it, hoping they have interest in even expanding into Canada, and then working through them however long it takes. So practically, I do on my, for myself, um, I lead our team. 
And I'm going out talking to those companies, developing studies to help inform us internally on what makes sense uh, to go after, and then managing my team to kind of manage their own um, spaces as well. So talking about the skills, traits, personalities associated with this role, um, I think this is where my education comes to help me on this role and how I got into this space. It's a good understanding of project economics and the value proposition for investment. You have to have, have a good understanding of kind of how companies think about projects and where they want to invest and why they want to invest. Generally, no companies just want to come to Canada to build projects for the fun of it. They want to make money. So you have to be able to kind of structure everything you do around this idea of how do we present the opportunity that they can make return and kind of figure out ways to optimize that return. Because often Canada is competing with jurisdictions around the world, Saudi Arabia, Southeast Asia, US Gulf Coast, and there's no one's batting down the doors to come to Canada. So you need to kind of figure out exactly how to drive into their motives. On more of the, the softer side, I think you have to have a, a strong drive and ability to learn. Every day is kind of different around here. You're just talking about chemicals and projects that I've never heard of sometimes before. And it's figuring out how to connect the dots and, and understand what the opportunities are, how to start learning about these types of projects, being able to kind of pick up what you need to know really quickly. You have to have, I would say, strong interpersonal skills. A lot of this is client focused. Um, you are going and developing relationships with business development professionals from a variety of organizations, whether it be the companies you're going after, or it's economic development groups that you're working with, or government agencies, which kind of widen your sales funnel. Um, so that when you're out in the world, people are pointing companies to you and you can tap into different uh, groups. So you have to be able to develop strong relationships and, and work well with people just kind of one of the core principles of our job. Um, you gotta be client focused, putting the needs of your clients kind of above everything else almost. So really making, putting them first and that requires kind of often a lot of sacrifice in your personal life and, and really just making sure that the priority is number one for getting investments. Being able to collaborate with a lot of individuals. So I work with engineers, economists, finance professionals, Kind of just a range of backgrounds and it's being able to effectively communicate and, and get along with everybody. Um, somewhat outgoing. I think a lot of the times we're, we're deep into project analysis here, but often you have to be willing to go do some cold calling, reach out to people, go to receptions, start strike up conversations, actively seek out people who don't necessarily even want to talk to you. So you have to have a, a, a personality that lends itself to be willing to go and engage with new people. And it's, it's quite honestly a lot easier once you enjoy that because there is a lot of fun to it. And so I think that's kind of it for this slide. So working conditions. Um, I work out of an office in Fort Saskatchewan. There's a picture of it on the left there. It's a regular office. I got a desk. I got a chair. There's a coffee machine. There's about nine people total in our organization. So a typical office setup. For my job specifically, and a lot of the foreign direct investment focused economic development groups, you're traveling around the world a lot. So this was a live shot of me doing this presentation on a plane on my last trip. And then some of the last locations I've been around in the, I'd say the last six to eight months. So you're kind of, for me, going all over the world, um, US a lot, Asia a lot, Middle East quite a bit, Europe, um, pretty much the only regions we don't really go to too often are Africa, South America, um, but kind of everywhere else in play. And you've got a lot of control and where you're going as long as you can justify and, and make and really focus on how you're going to get in front of the companies and the jurisdictions you're going to. The rewards of the occupation, um, it's different every day. It's you're working with a lot of different types of companies. You are working with a lot of very sophisticated senior le level officials or senior level representatives from companies and governments around the world, which is incredibly interesting. Um, just being able to sit in the room with a lot of these very high level individuals is rewarding itself. And you get to learn a lot about how they view the world and just the world itself. I think when you are focused more internationally, which I am with this job, it's it's it gives you a lot of perspective. Um, kind of leading up to this job, I didn't spend a lot of time outside of Canada, just vacationing primarily, doing some trips. But you kind of it changes your whole perspective on both your occupation and the world itself. Once you get on the world and talk with people from a lot of different cultures, a lot of different places, I'd be recommending that for everyone, whether it's professional or personal in itself. For me, we lead a small team. We're very nimble so you have a lot of freedom in what you do it's figuring out 
how to get investment. That's your, your core mandate. And then you kind of have total control and figuring out how exactly you're going to go about doing that. So if I've worked in jobs in the past where it's very like cookie cutter, this is the sequence. It's very linear in what you do. This is kind of all over the map and it's, it's good for some personalities, um, but it's difficult for others where it's, it's not yeah linear as we call it. You are kind of stretching all over the place, tapping into different um, pieces of your mind, working with different groups and really just controlling your destiny on how you want to deliver on your projects. And from, I also work on a strong collaborative team. So both kind of our entire organization um, are all smart individuals um, with different backgrounds. And on my team itself, you're managing sophisticated, very well-educated individuals. So you get to work with a team you're kind of learning from constantly. Some of the challenges of this type of job, and this all ranges, um, economic development is a broad space. Um, but for my role specifically, you, you play an important role, I believe, in attracting projects to Canada, but it's a small role. Ultimately, if a company is going to look to spend $5 billion, you're not going to convince them to do that. They're, it's going to go through tremendous due diligence. There's a lot of external factors. You're talking about like federal interplay, provincial politics, um, corporate politics from wherever they're from. Like there's a lot of factors that go into the success of these projects. So you play an important role kind of the front end, getting them in the door, facilitating relationships, kind of walking through how to build stuff, providing information. But ultimately it's, there's a lot of failure in this job and it's a lot of reasons that are outside of your control. So that's frustrating for a lot of people is it's not, you do X, you get Y. So you do X and then you throw your hands in the air and kind of hope for the best um, while still working as hard as you can to get them all the information and present them the best case possible. The, this lifestyle for when you're traveling a lot doesn't lend itself to necessarily everybody. So I'd say pre COVID like COVID kind of changed the way we work, obviously we stopped traveling internationally. But prior to that, I spent about 120 nights in a hotel room. Some people really like that. Some people don't. Some people struggle with that on a personal side. So it really depends on what, what where you're at in your life and kind of what you're looking for. Um, I think generally you find that people that don't travel a lot for work really are jealous of it. And the people who travel a lot for work don't want to be traveling anymore. So it, it's one of those grass is always greener, but it, it, it lends itself to God's advantages, but it's also difficult on your personal life and you're, you're missing things at home. It it can be difficult, but there's also the upside of you get to go travel around the world and have some unique experiences. So I put down the work can often be abstract. Um, you're not, this isn't a linear job of building a widget. You're trying to make various connections, figuring out kind of, you're in murky waters trying to figure out how projects can get developed, who you need to be talking to. So it's it's abstract at times. It's it's definitely not um, fixed. It is in the sense of what you're what you're trying to accomplish, but how you get there can often be a little bit on the abstract side. And the hours aren't standard. Um, it's, it's salary to occupation. I'll talk about the salary benefits after, but it's all over the map. You are, and, and a lot of this is good too. So it's not just a uh, pure challenges, but you're going out for dinners. You're, when you're traveling, you're just kind of on the clock the entire time. You're working across time zones. So you're working late nights or just weird hours in general. So that can be difficult for a lot of people. On the salary and benefit side, so wide ranging. There's once again economic development's a wide varying space. I put for a director level, talking to some of my colleagues, you're probably in the one hundred to two hundred thousand dollar range for comparable roles. It really depends on where you go. As I mentioned before, there's there's economic development groups at the municipal level. So like the I'm sure the city of Saskatoon's got an economic development team, or a city of Regina, or most even smaller municipalities. They exist at the provincial level and the federal level. So it's often a function of the. Uh, the funding your organization has in general. Um, I'd say like, typically if you're in a, a wealthier municipality or organization, then you lend itself to the higher side, but it, it really depends on where you go and what exactly you're doing. Uh, the benefits, um, they're strong. One of the really good parts of this job is we do got great benefits. You got health spending account, personal spending account, allows you to cover up what's not covered under your plan itself, but also with a personal spending account, you can buy stuff like golf memberships or or snowboards or whatever you need um, out of your, your funding. Extended health and dental, kind of all the benefits. I never really thought about getting into a job, but it's it's good as you get older, I'm learning. Uh, I get a corporate phone, uh, personal vehicle, we use those. You get some mileage when you're traveling yourself. 
Um, on the pension side, so some of the government agencies I've worked for in the past, as well as this one, have a defined benefit pension plan, which is excellent to have nowadays. These are somewhat rare. So once again, when I was looking for a job, even when I took this one five years ago, I didn't really care about a pension plan. wasn't thinking about that at the point in my life, but it turns out it's got some serious value. So it's um, when you're comparing roles on the total uh, compensation package, this becomes a, a major advantage in a role like this. Vacation, typically three to four weeks. I sit around four weeks, which is pretty good. I think often I find it's harder to actually use your vacation um, in this role because you, it's, you just, you're doing so much stuff and you're taking on a lot that you don't have a whole lot of time just to knock out two weeks or three weeks or four weeks at a time. Um, the hours, once again, it kind of depends. For me, it's based off a 35 hour work week. I work much more than a 35 hour work week and the hours are not standard. It's nine to five, eight to four, whatever you want to call it, but it's typically a lot longer. You're just taking calls when you need to, um, traveling when you need to. So it, it varies, but there are people, um, people on my team as well, who are more, they've got uh, personal commitments and they can button it up to be more of a eight to four, nine to five type arrangement. But it really depends on kind of where you're at, what you're looking to do and how you want to structure your, your position. Educational requirements. So I I would say most, or typically, at least in our organization, you probably bachelor's is the minimum you'd need. Discipline doesn't really matter. I think as long as you can demonstrate the relevancy for these types of roles. I come from economics. Um, I've got two other economists on my team. Uh, we've also got an engineer. We've got um, people with degrees in political science, um, communication. So it really varies. I think what I'm finding as we hire people is not so much what your exact discipline is. It's more so can you apply it to your job? That's what kind of matters most. Once you get into the director level type roles, you're looking probably 10 plus years experience or just demonstrating that you've had, whether it's management experience or, or been in similar roles for about that decade mark. And then I think most importantly is that demonstrate understanding of your subject matter. Um, I think when we go through hiring, we've done it a few times. I, if they can demonstrate they know what they're talking about, um, if they're hired to go after, let's say, petrochemicals, if they can demonstrate they understand that business very well, that's kind of what trumps everything. And beyond that, I'd say it's not an educational requirement, but a lot of these hires are off personal fits, um, finding out if it's going to be the right personalities because there been organizations before where you don't want to work for a place or you don't want to be hiring people that you know are not going to be a good personality fit. It just makes every day quite a bit longer. How I got here. So I graduated high school. I had decent grades. They weren't amazing. I don't think you kind of cut a path anywhere, but they're good enough to get accepted into most universities. I really had no idea what I wanted to do out of high school. The professional golf program to be seemed to be the most interesting, but there wasn't a wasn't a great future in that once you talk to a lot of those those pros. So I walked away from that, which kind of led me to looking at kind of the more open-ended programs. And I settled on the Bachelor of Commerce program and or it's more so a pre-commerce program. The way it works in Alberta, I think each school is different, but typically for Bachelors of Commerce is at most of the, the universities, you have to compete to get in. So you do a year or two of pre-commerce in an arts or a science program to apply in. So I got accepted both into the University of Alberta and the McEwen University. Um, at U of A was for arts um, with the intention of going to commerce and then McEwen University, it was straight into their commerce program where they structure your, your program for you to compete into commerce. I ended up going to the McEwen University um, because it had that direct shot to commerce and thought it'd be kind of easier to compete in um, from that school versus the U of A. So I did end up doing two years of the pre-commerce, got accepted into the commerce program. But at that point, I'd taken a number of classes in economics. Actually, there's kind of two reasons why I switched out of commerce. I really enjoyed the economics programs or the economics classes. With, so I decided to pursue that further. But I also really hated accounting classes. So that kind of one-two punch lent me to going transferring to the U of A, but um, into their economics program, which is an arts degree. So each school is different. Um, the Bachelor of Arts program has economics. Sometimes economics is housed within business. Sometimes it's, it's housed within science. It just depends on the school you're going to. But uh, I ended up landing there and I really enjoyed the program. Uh, the subject matter is, was very interesting to me. You can go deep into the micro side, which is more so like 
think I'd say how businesses and individuals think and how they make actions versus the macro side, which is more so at the government levels like GDP. Um, what are those really more abstract economic factors and the study of them? For me, one of my profs described like you, uh, the economics program as it's the study of incentives. And, and then every prof kind of describes economics differently, but that's kind of one that really resonated with me where it's you, you get a framework of how to apply almost incentives to kind of every aspect of life, whether it's kind of financial markets, um, capital budgeting decisions, sports betting, whatever you want. It can take you down a variety of lanes. And that's where the interest really was for me. So I focused my degree around the micro side of economics. Uh, corporate behavior of the firm is, is some of the stuff you'll read into if you look at these programs, um, sports, economics, all that kind of stuff. The route after in economics is kind of weird. It's a very interesting program, but you're you've got to you get a good framework for how to view the world, but you don't have really the toolkit to do anything well. It's not like you're an accountant where you come up like, all right, this is how you balance a ledger. It's I've got these a framework for thinking about the world that you can apply to different things, but there's it's difficult to figure exactly what it lends itself to. A lot of the people go into law school. Um, that was my intention, but uh, I'd say once you get into university, if that's your path, then start talking about professionals in the, in those spaces and figure out if you really want to do it. Because after speaking with a number of lawyers, it, I decided it wasn't a good fit for me. So I ended up just uh, floating through, got my bachelor's, and then even when I graduated, had no clear direction on what I wanted to do. So like most people, once they graduate university, I needed money. So you're applying pretty much everywhere that you think is a good idea. I think some people, if you're graduating top of your class, you're, you got that an intern issue in some results. That wasn't necessarily me. So I was spanning applications out, all, I'd say all across Western Canada in a variety of spaces and getting a few offers. Um, so I started working with the Department of Energy in Alberta. This goes back to when commodities being very strong. So there was a lot of hiring in our in our provincial government, especially within the Department of Energy. Didn't know really much about the space, but ended up becoming a policy analyst and then transferring more into just a, a pure kind of economic analyst role or economist role, focusing around market fundamentals, which is kind of what my background in school lent itself towards, how financial markets function, looking at commodities pricing, how to um, manage exposure to commodity pricing, forecast prices, all that kind of stuff. It's um it's interesting working governments, kind of you do it for a few years, you find out if you, it's for you or if it's not for you. It was not for me. So I ended up transferring or applying for a different job outside with the Alberta Utilities Commission. So that's a provincial regular regulator. They regulate the price of natural gas and electricity, or at least what I focused on within that uh, space. This was a really, you work with a lot of economists and lawyers in this type of role. So even one of my former profs was one of our commission members. He worked very close thinking about economic theory and how to apply that to um, a regulated space. The general idea is you're, you're regulating in the absence of a market, self-regulating. So it was very interesting from an economics perspective. Um, you get to really think critically about theory, but also practically look at what this means for on, the, on a more micro level, on an individual rate payer basis. So I did that for a few years. And then I ended up moving over to the Alberta Industrial Heartland Association, which is my current role. I came in as a senior business development rep, and now I'm the director of the group. How I got to this role, there's not really a clear, clear line if you just solely looked at this, uh, this slide. But um, back when I used to work at the Department of Energy, I focused all around petrochemical economics. So being able to model the economic value of developing assets in Alberta. More so from a policy perspective on how would you incent this? Like how would you flow cash into these projects to most effectively get them to a final investment decision? But through that, that time in government, I got to know people who worked at the, at the Industrial Heartland Association and became friends with them. Um, so I had a wide network of people. So when they were hiring, they reached out because they thought I'd be a good fit. So I find a lot of the people I work with, a lot of my classmates from university, a lot of the roles they're in now are all based to kind of around the relationships they have, or at least they're a catalyst in kind of where they've landed today. So that was an important step to even getting to the heartland was just having a wide network of people. So when you're looking for jobs, you, you at least can kind of um, be pointed towards them or almost have an advantage, not advantage necessarily, but an ability to, to pursue them easily, more easily, I guess, easier. That's probably the word.
So at the same time, I was doing all this work journey. Um, I think once you start entering these types of spaces, bachelor is kind of the minimum. Um, it seems like you have to do something more no matter what. So for me, my interest is more so on the financial side of economics. So I did a professional designation. It's called the Energy Risk Professional. It's uh, administered by the Global Association of Risk Professionals. Risk um, often has kind of got the negative connotation. So it's kind of like how to prevent it, but risk is kind of a two-sided coin. It's how to properly manage risk, how to take advantage of risk. Um, so this lends itself in the energy space to how do you trade commodities? How do you make money off of commodities? How do you manage your positions with commodities? So that was, it was a direct uh, applicability to my role in the government forecasting prices. And then I also started pursuing the CFA program. So that's the Chartered Final Final Financial Analyst Program. Um, that's probably the gold standard for finance degrees within um the world so if any of you are thinking about going to finance you're probably going to go look to go down that path i passed level one stopped at level two didn't pursue the third level three or two or three it's an incredibly difficult program but i think um there's a big advantage for employers just showing that you're willing to go into these programs and sacrifice a lot of your personal time to try to develop your your professional career that way um on the opportunities in the space Economic development for what I'm doing now, there's a there's a ton of economic development agencies. The stuff that's internationally focused is a lot rarer. Um, foreign direct investment jobs are you're pretty much having to go to the federal government or the provincial governments. Um, I'd say like a, a association like mine is niche and it's kind of rare within Canada. Um, but globally, there's also these groups that exist all over the place. Um, we work quite a bit with different groups that are based in various locations around the world. And there's, if you're looking to get out of Canada or explore your options outside of Canada, this is a good way because often it's, you're working just on the other side of the coin, whether it's trying to bring Canadian companies overseas or kind of facilitate trade. There's some interesting jobs there and it can give you a lot of international or good international exposure. For your career growth, um, a lot of times it's, these are relatively small groups. Sometimes they've got the linear path, path to becoming a start as an analyst or that lower kind of BD rep role and then moving up into director role, into executive director role, into vice president roles, however the organization is structured. But often there's a lot of uh, people jumping around. You're just going from one kind of organization to the next as you advance in and around. And once again, like once you're in the space, there is a lot of opportunity to go around the world, stay within North America, stay within Canada. It really can guide yourself how you want to position your life. Some people remain in economic development for their entire careers. Some people don't. It really depends. I didn't come from economic development for this role. I came from more of a subject matter space as to how I got into this place. But um, a lot of people I work with, they'll they'll do this their entire careers. Their degrees will be pointed this way or their experiences will get them in that way. It really, it's a pretty wide ranging space. So you can kind of structure your career however you want. On the work-life balance side, um, it depends once again. Every organization is differently. For a role like mine, speaking to that one, it's tough at times. You're traveling a lot. Um, I was just in Asia and I'm off to the US next week. So you are, you're you're moving around quite a bit. Uh, the hours are inconsistent and long and not necessarily bad. Like there's a lot of dinners. There's a lot of hosting. There's a lot of, of stuff that's enjoyable, but they are long. No days necessarily the same. I think there's it requires taking care of your personal relationship as well as your health, making more of an active effort. I think everyone, when they start these kind of roles and you're going for a lot of dinners, they pack on the weight almost immediately. So as focusing on the gym becomes important and trying to manage your life that way. Um, once again, the it, travel can also be really tough on some people. I personally enjoy it, but uh, you talked, I've got no major really commitments. Uh, I'm married. I've got a dog, no kids, but um, those with kids, like it becomes a lot more limited when you can't be gone for two weeks in a month or half the year, a third of the year, whatever it is. So it really depends on, on what you want in life, but for certain roles, especially when you're, you move kind of up and into these roles where you have to take on a lot of responsibility. Um, it is challenging to manage the work-life balance and yeah, the, the travel can be intensive once again. So that is it for me that I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, no, no questions, Chris, but just, uh, just a general comment. Uh, you did an awesome job of, of describing your career progression 
and, and the decisions you had to make and, all, and of course, how it uh, related to your education background. And I think that's really important for, for students pursuing this area to know. So, um, yeah, as I said, fantastic job. Thanks for taking the time today to, uh, to do this and um, good luck um, on your next set of travels. All right. Thanks a lot. And thanks for having me.